All right. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, today I'm going to focus on my privacy research um, with uh, lots of colleagues and students. Um, all of this is definitely very uh, collaborative and many, many people are involved in it. Um, just a quick note on um, uh, just a little CMU plug here before I get started. Um, so I direct our security and privacy institute called Scilab at CMU. Um, it's kind of an umbrella for uh, all things security and privacy at CMU. So if you are trying to connect with people and you don't know where to find them in our confusing uh, structure here, uh, start with the Scilab website and uh, check out our directory and may, may help point you in the right direction. Um, also want to mention uh, two of the academic programs that I um, advise students in. There are actually many more, but these are the, the two main ones. Uh, so the Privacy Engineering Master's Program is one of them, um, and we now have both full-time and part-time remote options. And then the Societal Computing PhD program uh, is uh, where most of my PhD students uh, have, have come from. Uh, so this is in our School of Computer Science, but it's a, a very interdisciplinary program. All right, so uh, privacy policies. Um, one of my most cited papers, I think, is this paper that I wrote with Alicia McDonald. Um, it was published back in 2008. Uh, Alicia is now on our faculty in privacy engineering here. Um, Alicia started with the question of what would happen if people actually started reading privacy policies? And um, you know, at first I said to her, well, that's not going to happen. So why is this interesting to study? Um, but she convinced me that it would be interesting uh, just as a thought experiment and um, eventually turned into a whole paper. Uh, basically what Alicia did is she looked at how many different websites do people visit in a month. Um, she got data on lots of websites, how many words they are. Um, she got data on the adult reading speed. Um, you know, she kind of crunched all the numbers and said that if you were to try to read, you know, just just once, um, the privacy policy of all the websites that you visit in a month, um, this would end up being about 244 hours per year of work, um, which is kind of ridiculous. And even some of us who are privacy researchers probably don't spend that much time just reading privacy policies. Uh, so if we are relying on people to read privacy policies to protect their privacy, then that seems pretty clearly unworkable. Um, and you know the reason it takes so long is that the, you know they're they're long, and many of them look something like this, and they're really not all that readable. And you know, we're not the only ones who have said this. Uh, so this is a White House report in 2014 um, that referred to this as a fantasy world that people would actually read um, privacy notices and things like that. Um, so people aren't reading privacy policies, um, but there are other types of privacy related interfaces. Uh, so we've focused a lot on privacy choice interfaces and they are everywhere. Um, so these include things like cookie banners, um, and we're doing some work on that right now, which uh, I will get to at the end of the talk. It's kind of the work in progress. Um, there are in social media, there are audience controls, so you can you know, decide if you want to post, you know, just to your friends or publicly or whatnot. Um, if you download mobile apps, there are app permission interfaces. Um, there's all sorts of controls for third party advertising. Um, there's all sorts of marketing uh, related opt outs available. And now in California, we have the CCPA, uh, which has this do not sell my personal information uh, link or button. Um, and then with GDPR, we have privacy rights interfaces where you can you know, actually exercise your privacy rights under GDPR. Uh, and and the, you know, these are just a few examples. So we have lots and lots of privacy choice interfaces, uh, but overall they're actually pretty difficult to use. And what we've found um, in our research, and you know, this is backed up by just anecdotally what 
what you know everybody observed, but but we have data too, is um, that overall these interfaces tend to be hard to find. Um, if you even if you can find them, uh, often they present choices that it's it's difficult to figure out what the choice means, or even like the polarity of the choice, which you know should be the most obvious thing, but it's often not. Uh, often they require many clicks to do what you want to do. Uh, sometimes they are actually deceptive, and we refer to this as dark patterns. Um, and sometimes uh, they offer some choices, but not the choices that the users are actually looking to make. And then this gets even more complicated in an IoT world where we're not just making decisions about the, you know, what websites um, or apps are doing with our data, but we have sensors that exist in the world, not, you know, just in our computers and phones. And, you know, we have these drones flying overhead, we have light bulbs in the ceiling. And, you know, you can't like, walk into a room and look at the light bulb and read its privacy policy, <laughs> like what is going on up there, um, doesn't, doesn't really work. Uh, and so this, this adds uh, to, to the difficulty in communicating about privacy and giving people meaningful choices. Uh, so, you know, we often ask this question of, well, how can we put people in control over their personal information? Um, we're not just going to give up on the idea, you know, what, what is it that we can do about this? All right, so I'm going to talk about some, some of the things that people are doing going beyond traditional tech privacy policies. Um, I'll talk a bit about IoT. Um, I'll talk about uh, privacy choices on websites and um, CCPA in California. Um, and I'll talk about uh, our work on cookie banners. So uh, a few years ago, I worked with Florian Schaub, who is now at the University of Michigan, and Rebe Rebecca Balibaco and Adam Durity, who are both at Google. Um, now, they, they, all these people were at CMU at the time. Um, and we developed something called a design space for effective privacy notices. And what we looked at was, well, what, what are the choices for when and how and where you can provide privacy information to users. Um, and this was uh, mostly in a website context, but going beyond that as well. And so uh, I'm not gonna go through the, the, the whole taxonomy here, but you can, you can look up the paper if you're interested. But, but basically the idea that you, know, you could give all this information up front, but maybe there are other times that make more sense um, you can show the information on your primary device, and that probably makes sense if the device is a laptop, but if the device is like a thermostat or a light bulb or something, you probably need some kind of a secondary device or maybe a public sign on the wall to provide information. Um, the visual channel is the most obvious channel. You can read it, you can look at symbols, but sometimes it makes more sense to provide this information in an auditory announcement or haptic, you know, your device vibrates when, when you should be aware of, you know, your voice being recorded or something, or maybe even machine readable, which is my favorite, um, so that uh, your device can kind of keep track of what's going on and only warn you when there are things that uh, you really wanna know. Um, and then there's the question of, uh, do we just put this notice out there and so what? Or do we actually block the user from doing something until they've made some sort of a choice? Uh, here's some examples of privacy notices that are not you know, traditional plain text privacy notices. Uh, so we have a video game uh, company that puts their privacy notice in the form of a game, um, which I think is a really cool idea in theory. Um, uh, in practice, I was less impressed. It did not seem like it was the best way to convey information, although it is kind of creative. Uh, we see lots of examples of companies that are making short videos usually not of their whole privacy policy, um, because again, the attention span to like watch, you wouldn't wanna watch a 30 minute video about Google's privacy policy. Um, but Google has many short, like 30 second videos about different aspects of their privacy policy. 
and then we see a lot of work with icons, um, which uh, have some things going for them, but also a lot of problems. And I'm gonna talk mostly about some of the problems. Uh, here are two sets of privacy icons that were both designed by very good designers. Um, and I think they're very attractive, um, but I don't think they do a great job of conveying information unless they appear with words. And uh, I have them here with words, but on your display, it may be too small to even read the words. Um, and you can see there's like a lot of different privacy concepts here. So I think if we were trying to convey, you know, one or two, um, even if it wasn't obvious what it meant, we over time would learn it. But if we're trying to convey, you know, a dozen different things, that's a lot to learn. And so I think these icons may be useful in reinforcing uh, what we're seeing um, in the text and maybe making it easier to kind of see at a glance. Uh, but uh, you know, it's been proposed that, oh, we just put a few icons in the corner of a website and people can tell about the privacy from that. And that, that may not be realistic if we want to convey information at the level of detail that these icon designers were hoping for. Um, another approach is to make something that's kind of like a nutrition label. Uh, so the nice thing about nutrition labels is that they're standardized and, you know, we're not all born knowing what it means when it says that, you know, it's a percentage of daily value and cholesterol and, you know, all that stuff. Um, but once you learn it, you can look at any food product in the U.S. and it's going to use the same vocabulary and it's going to be formatted the same way. And you can go through most of your life ignoring it. And then when you go to your doctor and your doctor is like, you have to watch your cholesterol and your sodium and you know whatever. Now you have a way that you can watch it. You can go and look at those food products and get that information uh, when you need it. Uh, and it makes it really easy to put two food products or more side by side and compare them on the things that you're interested in. So, you know, can we do this for privacy? Um, my students uh, spent a lot of time iterating over uh, a privacy nutrition label for websites. And they started with something that looked more like a food nutrition label and it was black and white with a lot of text. And they ended up with what you see here. Um, what we have is down the left column are different types of data and across the top are different uses and sharing of data. And um, the colors uh, indicate, you know, whether it's done or, or not done. And so you can kind of see at a glance that the company on the left is using more types of data and using them for more purposes uh, than, than the company on the right. Uh, so this is something that we uh, tested um, in uh, focus groups and then in uh, lab and online studies. And, um, and it, it actually works pretty well. Um, now it wasn't actually adopted, um, but, but the concept I think uh, is a good one. As for something that's actually been adopted, uh, this is the standard for uh, privacy labels for financial organizations, banks. And uh, these are from two actual banks. And you can see that they look roughly the same in, in the layout and the format. Um, each bank can use their own fonts and color scheme, um, but they're, they're providing the same information in the same order and with this nice table at the bottom. This actually goes on for like three pages, but, but the table part is the most valuable part of it um, because it allows you to directly compare on several different um, uh, characteristics, the privacy policies of multiple banks. Now this was designed uh, for paper. Um, now you get them, um, besides on paper, they're PDFs um, on websites. Uh, it wasn't designed as machine readable, which is a really uh, lost opportunity. Um, so a few years ago, uh, we wrote a crawler to go crawl the web and find all these PDF files and parse them. Um, sadly, they are imperfect. Uh, some of them you know, put things in the wrong order and have typos and whatever, um, but we were able to um, you know, use some heuristics to put them back together properly and put them all in our database. And so we have over 6,000 banks' privacy notices in our database. 
um, we're not keeping it up to date, but we have it, we have it out there, you can try it as it's just a demonstration of this is what you can do when you have this privacy information in this standardized format. Um, and so this allows you to do things like, you know, type in your zip code, find the banks in your zip code and compare them based on privacy. And, you know, you can see in, in the, the chart on the right um, that, uh, you know, there's a bunch of banks that uh, it's a lot of green, which basically means they're, they're not doing these um, privacy and basic practices. Um, but as you go down the page, there are more banks that, that are doing more privacy and basic practices. Um, so uh, I think I think this is uh, this is a pretty good idea. Uh, there are a lot of things that are wrong with the standardized financial labels, and we wrote a paper about that. But there's there's a lot to like about it as well. Um, another project uh, that was done at CMU um, with uh, a number of my colleagues, um, including Shomir, um, uh, was to um, uh, find find a way to make it easier for people to find opt outs on websites. Uh, and the the idea here is if I go to a website and I want to opt out of marketing and targeted advertising and whatever else, um, it actually is not all that easy to find what I have to do. And so if we can automatically parse the website, use machine learning to find that spot where, the opt-out information, uh, ideally an opt-out button is, um, then we can save the user having to poke around a lot. Um, so this is in the form of a browser plugin and you can go to a website and you can find out where all of the opt-outs are. Um, you still have to actually go visit them and exercise your opt-outs, but at least, at least we help you find them all. Uh, so that, that can be a useful tool as well. All right, so I just showed you a bunch of ideas and tools um, and ways of making privacy choices easier. Um, and uh, I gave you my opinion on some of them as to what I think is useful or not. Um, but it would be nice if we could actually evaluate them and, um, and know what works and what doesn't. Um, because a lot, of, a lot of companies are making claims, especially to regulators, that they've got this privacy thing under control, they're giving people choices, everything's good. And, um, and I've seen a lot of what companies are offering that they are telling the FTC and other regulators is good, and it doesn't really seem to be good. Um, so how can we um, measure the effectiveness of privacy notices and other privacy tools? Um, well, in the case of a privacy notice, you know, the first thing we might wanna know is whether anybody even notices the notice, because uh, some of these things are buried you know, in the bottom of a web page where you wouldn't even notice that it was there. Um, if people notice it, do they bother to stop and read it? If they read it, do they understand it? Um, and we, we are seeing that a lot of these things are written at a very advanced reading level that a lot of people probably don't understand. Uh, if they understand it, does it actually convey useful information? Does it answer the questions that they want to know? Um, and does this actually impact their decision-making or behavior? Um, and you know, th this means that you know, once I've read the information, um, do Am I able to say, hey, I am very comfortable with this website, I'm going to proceed anyway, or no, I'm not comfortable giving them my information, so I'm going to go somewhere else, or I'm just going to visit but not type anything in or, or whatever. So can I use it to make those, those kinds of decisions? Um, so I uh, worked at the Federal Trade Commission for a year in 2016 as the, the chief technologist, and one of the things that I uh, worked on at the FTC was trying to um, get the FTC to actually ask these kinds of questions, you know, when companies said, oh, we have a good, good solution to our privacy communication. Um, and I said, you know, we should have a set of criteria that, that we look at for how to evaluate these privacy notices. Um, and then my, my colleagues at the FTC said, well, you know, the FTC does things besides privacy and they look at like organic product labeling and all sorts of other things. 
And they have the same problem too of how to evaluate those disclosures. So we held a workshop um, called Putting Disclosures to the Test. And the, the, this was um, back in 2016, but it's still like super relevant. And all of the videos and transcripts and our final report are on the FTC website. Um, Basically, uh, we, we had people working in different fields, you know, in privacy, in drug labeling, in, in uh, food nutrition labeling, and they were all effectively doing the same thing, even though they had never talked to each other. Um, they all talked about how important it was to do evaluations, to actually test with real humans. Um, and even if you have a low budget, and even if you can't do the perfect test or a large test, just doing some testing uh, gives you a lot of insights and often improves things. Um, and the other big point they made was that it's important to test comprehension in context. Uh, so it's tempting to just take a picture of whatever your, your notice is and show it to people and say, hey, do you understand it? Um, and uh, yeah, you can get some uh, information about that, especially if it's really not understandable. You know, people may tell you that. Um, but there are a lot of things that you read and they kind of make sense. And then when you have to use them, you realize how little sense they actually made. And so what everybody was saying is, you know, you need to give your uh, participants some sort of a realistic scenario of why they would actually need to read this disclosure and then see if they can um, make uh, informed decisions within that scenario. So I thought that was an important takeaway. All right, so let me tell you about a study that we did along those lines. Um, this, this is a pretty old study um, that I did with my colleague, Alessandro Acquisti, and our students at the time, Janice Sai uh, and Serge Egelman. Um, Janice is now at Google and Serge is now at Berkeley. Um, so we had this search engine that we developed um, that could put a privacy meter next to search results. So you could see how good the privacy policy was. Um, this, this was in some ways hypothetical. Um, we, we couldn't actually do this for every website, but um, uh, we, what we were interested in is, let's say that we could do this, that we had a search engine that could really do this for every website. Would people actually pay attention to it? And uh, the context that, that seems most promising that people might pay attention would be if you're trying to make a purchase online. So would, would you uh, choose your uh, online merchant on the basis of privacy information? And so uh, we did actually a series of studies. It took a while to get this right. Um, but uh, eventually we, um, we did a study with 72 people in our lab. Um, and we asked them to purchase two items with a new shopping search engine. And uh, we had different uh, experimental groups, I'll show you in a minute. Um, we paid them and told them that they were gonna have to use some of that money to make their purchases, but they could keep the change. So there was um, some incentive for them to wanna purchase the less expensive item. Uh, but they were all using their own credit cards uh, at real stores. And so there was also an incentive to want to protect their privacy. Okay, so um, we, uh, this was all, as I said, real, real credit card, real merchants. The only thing that we had um, kind of faked here is the search results. Um, so when they searched for the products, and so one of them was a AA um, batteries, Duracell AA batteries, we always provided the same search results for the first four hits. Um, and they looked something like this. And um, we had three conditions. So the first condition, they had a privacy meter. Uh, the second condition, they had a handicapped accessibility meter, um, which was completely fake. That, that was whatever the privacy meter would have said, we said that was handicapped accessibility. And then the third condition, they didn't have the meter. Um, in all conditions, we showed them the price of the product with shipping. Uh, so we didn't have the confounding factor of whether or not they went and looked up the shipping price. Okay. Uh, and we set it up so that these first four results always started with the worst privacy, and then the fourth one had the best privacy, and they always started with the lowest price, and then the fourth one had the highest price. 
So um, what we wanted to see is where did people purchase most frequently? Uh, so what we expected is that if you had no information about privacy, then you should just uh, purchase at the, at the first link because it's the top of the page and people are very biased to just going to the first one and it's the cheapest. So why would you go anywhere else? And that's, a, that's exactly what we saw. Uh, but if they had privacy information, um, what we expected is that they would go further down the page. Um, and, uh, and that's what we saw as well. So not everybody did, but, but uh, a lot of people, and it was you know, statistically significant, uh, were paying a little bit more, I think it was about 65 cents more, uh, to purchase from a website that had better privacy. And then we also did this with a privacy sensitive item. In this case, it was a sex toy. And we found a larger effect in that case. All right. Another um, a study that we did looking at privacy information was instead of in search engines, here we looked at the Android App Store. And so we designed this privacy facts label to give you information about privacy in Android apps. Uh, and we did a mock-up of the Android App Store uh, with that information in it. And we did a lab study um, where uh, people came to our lab and we gave them an Android phone to use. And we told them to imagine that they were helping their friend um, choose a bunch of apps. And we gave them pairs of apps to look at um, that were similar apps. Um, and uh, half the people would see the privacy facts label and half the people saw the Android app store without the privacy facts label. So what we saw was that when people chose these apps for their friends, if they didn't have the label, they, they never mentioned privacy. Um, and if they had the label, um, many of them mentioned privacy as a factor in choosing. And they would often choose the app that seemed to be collecting less data. Um, now this wasn't always the case. So we saw that if we gave them a pair of apps and one of them was a very popular app and they were familiar with the brand, then they would be likely to ignore the privacy facts and just choose that one because it was really popular and the other one they'd never heard of. Um, similarly, if they would see um, under the reviews that one of them was really well rated and the other one wasn't, they would go with the one that was really well rated, again, regardless of the privacy information. Um, so privacy was definitely a factor, but it wasn't the only factor. Uh, it's also interesting that um, you know, this demonstrates that privacy facts could be useful. Um, privacy nutrition labels in an app store can be useful. Um, but you know, we published this back in 2013 and nothing happened until last year um, when Apple announced that they were going to add uh, privacy nutrition labels in their app store. Um, so we were very excited to see that. We heard through the grapevine um, that uh, our work actually did influence uh, what Apple did. Um, so that has since uh, rolled out and Google has announced that in a few months, they're going to be rolling out something similar. Um, so we've started looking at the uh, Apple iOS nutrition labels. Um, they are not perfect. We have a lot of, lots of concerns and problems with them, but it's really great to see them moving in this direction and hopefully they will refine them and make them better. All right, so a few lessons so far um, in, in uh, looking at these um, privacy, privacy information is that automation is really helpful here. Um, so if we can automatically generate labels, we can have them in standard formats. Um, this, is, this is really uh, helpful. Um, and then making them machine readable um, is, is super helpful because then we can actually make tools that do something useful for users. Because even if we have the most readable privacy policy, still nobody really wants to read privacy policies. So we really need to be able to um, build tools that are gonna be able to do something useful with that. And I'm gonna show you an example of that in the IoT context. Um, so uh, IoT, um, you know, we don't really even have the option of reading a full privacy policy on a screen because these devices don't have big screens and um, to work with. So it has often been suggested that IoT devices, um, where, whenever they have a sensor and the sensor is on, they should just blink or beep or something to let you know. 
Um, and, uh, you know, when you have a small number of devices, this I think is a really good idea. Uh, the problem is, how does this scale? Um, you can imagine a future where you walk into a room and there's just lots of blinky, beepy things all over the place. Um, and that seems um, like not all that useful. Um, you know, and you, you, you know, there's a lot of data being collected, but you don't know what it is. You don't know um, what it's going to be used for, who's behind it, any of those things. So we had the idea, well, if instead of or in addition to their blinking, these devices were also transmitting information about what uh, data they're collecting and what they're going to do with it in some sort of a computer readable format. Um, and then your personal device, your, your smartphone, or your smartwatch uh, could pick that up. Um, then it could process all of this information and do something useful with it. And so this is the idea of a personal privacy assistant, um, which I've worked on with a number of uh, faculty and students at CMU. Um, Norman Sade uh, has, has uh, kind of led that effort at CMU. Um, so uh, I might set up my personal privacy assistant to say, hey, you know, I don't really need to be warned about smart thermostats, smart light bulbs, but if there is a microphone in the room I'm walking into, yeah, I want to know that my voice is going to be recorded. And so, you know, you should vibrate my phone if I walk into a room and there, there's uh, active, you know, listening going on there. Um, so this is something that, that we've uh, prototyped um, at CMU. Um, and then we also have some apps to, to go with it. Uh, so this is the IoT Assistant app. And the idea is that if I want to find out about the IoT devices around me, I can pull out the app and it will tell me um, what, what it knows about in the area around me. And if there's some I'm interested in, I can click on it and I can get more information, right? What apps are collecting visual data and then uh, drill down further and see who's doing it. What are they gonna do with this data? Uh, so this is uh, the, this example is at CMU, and these are some basically CMU IoT research projects that are you know right there in the middle of the hallway. So everybody walking by is getting picked up by this thing, um, and now you can actually find out who's behind it and, and what data they're collecting. Um, and then we have a registry where where you can register your IoT devices, and we've also scraped uh, databases of um, surveillance cameras and things like that, so you can get information about the devices around you. Now, another problem um, that, that people have with privacy and IoT devices is if you want to buy one uh, for your own home um, and you want one that is not going to have lots of security and privacy problems. Uh, so people have read uh, on the news um, about all of these problems, but it's, uh, it's not obvious how you find the good ones that don't have these problems. So you might imagine that when you're shopping for your IoT devices, you could go online and just look on the website. Um, and there's a lot of information, like this is, you know, in Amazon, they give you a lot of uh, specifications of IoT devices, but there's no information about privacy or security. Uh, so you might say, well, okay, we'll look at the packaging. So you could go to a brick and mortar store and you could look at the packaging and, you know, every side of the packaging, no information about privacy or security. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not just Amazon and their devices. Um, you, can, you can look at other companies' devices, you can look at other stores, and it's the same problem. Um, I have found that Google has uh, a website um, now that um, has privacy and security information for their devices. Uh, last I checked, though, this wasn't on the packaging of the device, and it wasn't, um, it wasn't really easy to find when you were shopping for the device. If you knew where to look, you could find it. Um, and it's this is only for Google devices. So it would be nice if we had standardized labels, maybe privacy and security nutrition labels for IoT devices. So we did a mock-up of what that might look like um, and did an interview study to see how people might use uh, these sorts of labels. Um, and people were very interested in them. Um, but uh, what we learned is that people said, hey, they are not privacy and security experts, so they don't really know what they don't know. 
Um, and so they weren't really sure what exactly the labels should say. Um, so we did another study where we asked experts in IoT privacy and security to tell us you know, what should be on a label. We, we then um, refined the label based on what they suggested and then tested that um, with participants. And um, the experts gave us 47 different pieces of information they wanted on a label, which is a lot and probably overwhelming. Uh, and so we turned it into a layered label. So on the left, you see the, the parts of the label that we recommend putting on the device or putting on the top layer of the website. And then, uh, and this is, this is gonna be enough for what most consumers wanna know. But if you want more details, then you can click through or scan the QR code, and then you get the much more detailed version. So this is something that we have on our website. We have a complete specification. We have a wizard that generates this. And now all we need is companies to actually use it. Uh, so we're trying to find companies that might wanna pilot uh, actual use of the label. Okay, so let's look um, a bit at websites. Um, so we did a study where we looked at 150 websites and looked at what kind of opt-out choices they had for email, targeted ads, and data deletion. Um, and so we went to the home page, we created user accounts, we visited the privacy policy, we visited the account settings, and all of those places we looked for opt-outs and our research assistants recorded things like how many clicks does it take to get here, um, what are the words that are next to the choices, and, and things like that. So the good news is that privacy choices are pretty common. Um, most websites that offer email communications also have opt-outs for it. Um, so that was pretty good, but uh, it just went downhill from there. Um, so when we look at how hard it is to understand them, we find that overall privacy policies are kind of difficult to read. It requires a 10th grade reading level, but the opt out information in privacy policies is even harder to read. Uh, it requires a university level reading level. Uh, we also said, well, um, maybe you don't really need to read the whole privacy policy. You could just look for some key words. Um, so we looked at the headings in the privacy policy. So as you scroll through, what would you see in the headings? And there was no single engram that occurred in more than 20 of the 150 privacy policies that we looked at. So there weren't consistent headings um, that would tell you about your choices in privacy policies. So again, standardization would be really nice here. Um, we also see that some websites, this is Amazon, um, have a lot of choices and um, uh, a lot of check boxes. And in this case, uh, the big problem is that the box that you could tick to like to uncheck all the boxes is at the bottom. Um, and so you might spend a lot of time un unchecking boxes before you realize that you, you could just uncheck them all. Um, so we did a follow-up study in the lab. Um, so the first study was our trained research assistants trying to figure out how to opt out. Um, we did this with real users in the lab. And what we saw is that it took them many more clicks than it took a trained research assistant. So, you know, in reality, it's even worse than what we found in, in our lab study, in, in, our, in our original study with, with research assistants. All right. Um, so another uh, thing I mentioned, uh, icons. Um, the ad industry has been using this blue triangle thingy icon um, for uh, over a decade now. Um, and they claim that this is a great solution to privacy for targeted ads. We were finding that people didn't really know what it was. So we did a study with 1500 participants online in MTurk and um, we would show them uh, the icon with some words next to it. Now, ad choices is the word that usually appears next to it, but we tried a bunch of other words and phrases as well. And then we asked people things like, what would happen if you clicked on the icon? So in this case, 56% of people said more ads will pop up, which is wrong. 45% said it will take you to a page where you can buy ads on a website. That's wrong. Only 27% um, had the correct answer, which is it will take you to a page where you can opt out of tailored ads. Um, so that's really not very good. Uh, 
in our best case, where we put the words configure add preferences next to it, uh, then we did a lot better. Uh, so we got to up to 50% of the people with the right answer. Um, I mean, that's still not great, but it's a big improvement. Uh, so this goes to show that, first of all, the words are important. And second, that if the ad industry actually wanted to do better, they probably could if they put some more ex um, effort into uh, testing this. Right, so uh, we took a foray into trying to design uh, icons for the state of California. So as part of their CCPA, um, they have this requirement that websites have a do not sell my personal information link and optionally a button or logo. So we asked the state attorney general's office, what was that button or logo gonna look like? And they said they had no idea, but they were having a public comment period. So um, we had less than 90 days to, um, to comment. Um, and so we did a study where we first had to come up with icons and then test them and make some recommendations. So I'm just gonna very quickly show you what we did. We started with ideation lots of uh, very rough ideas about icons. Uh, we picked some that seemed most promising, uh, had some design students actually make them look nice. Um, so we had some that were related to choice and consent, some related to opting out. The idea here is you're, you're, the arrow is showing taking something out of a folder or, or a hole or a box. Um, and then we had some that used dollar signs uh, to really emphasize this do not sell personal information. Um, we also tested the um, Digital Advertising Association. So this is an industry icon, privacy rights icon. So there's that blue triangle thingy. And apparently if you make it green instead of blue, it means do not sell my personal information. So we figured we'd test that too. Um, so we did some tests on MTurk. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details here, um, but basically what we found is that um, without the words next to the icons, people didn't understand them. Um, there was uh, some uh, better understanding with this check and X that shows uh, choices about personal information or people would get that it conveys choices, the personal information, not so much. Um, the do not sell the, this dollar sign with an X through it um, often conveyed that, but it also conveyed a lot of other things like payments. Um, these uh, opt out icons were just confused people um, and the triangle one mostly confused people. And people didn't recognize the stop sign shape uh, when it was black. Uh, so we refined some of the icons, we made them in color, we did another evaluation. Um, once again, the most promising were this uh, uh, X'd out um, dollar sign and, and the toggle sign. Um, we looked at the, um, the misunderstandings that were conveyed by these and the toggle was actually much better. It, it didn't have that much misunderstanding. Um, the dollar sign, uh, a, lot, a lot of people thought it had something to do with money and cash and things like that. Um, then we did some testing on taglines that could go with it. Um, and then we did some combo testing of icons and taglines together. And here we did our testing in context. So we made this fake website for selling shoes and um, we had uh, people visit this website uh, with, the, with the shoe store and showing our icons and taglines and, uh, and answering questions about it. Uh, basically what we found is that um, once again, the, the words were important. Um, there were still lots of misconceptions, um, especially with the, uh, the slash dollar. Um, and uh, what we found is that, that the icons didn't have very much impact on the interpretation of the tagline. So the words were more important than the icon. The icon may have played a role in attracting attention, however. So we recommended um, to the Office of the Attorney General the use of this toggle icon with the words privacy options next to it. Um, but do not sell my personal information is what was in the California law. Um, the uh, California Attorney General turned around and said, okay, we're going to adopt this red icon. Um, and at first we, we thought, well, that's kind of similar to what we recommended, um, but we realized that it was different in an important way. 
And that was that, that their proposed red icon looked an awful lot like the iOS toggle switch or really any toggle switch that you see in apps or on websites. And our recommended icon specifically doesn't look like that sort of a toggle switch. Um, so we did another study um, where we compared theirs against ours and we, can, we switched the red and the blue as well. Um, and we tried a few variations. And basically what we found is that changing the size of the X doesn't make much difference. The color doesn't make much difference, but that shape of the icon really made a huge difference in people's understanding. Um, so uh, we reported this to the state of California and they removed the icon completely from their regulation, um, but said they were gonna come back to it. Um, and then they sent us some more icons to test and you can see that the new icons they sent us are actually very similar to the ones that we'd already tested. But okay, we were game for it. Um, we, did, we did the testing. They wanted us to test a few other things we hadn't tested before, and they wanted us to only recruit participants from California. Uh, so that made it a little bit more challenging, um, but we did it. And what we found is that you had the best communication with no icon. All of their icons were basically terrible. Um, and uh, the, the only thing that was good about the icon is it did uh, make people more likely to notice the link. Uh, so there is some value in an icon, but not these icons. So we told the um, Office of the Attorney General that, and six months later they came around and they recommended our icon. Um, so I think that was mostly a success eventually. Um, however, um, you know, it's been a, a, a while and we really aren't seeing anybody actually using the icon because it's entirely optional. So stay tuned. All right. Um, last thing I want to talk about, I know I'm short on time. I'm going to skip over this, but I want to talk about, yeah, cookie consent. Um, okay. So uh, you've probably seen a lot of these cookie pop-ups um, on websites, and we wanted to see uh, how, what we could recommend for making better uh, cookie consents that people would actually understand and pay attention to. So we um, uh, looked at a lot of them, over about 200 of them that were out uh, in the wild. And um, we, we looked at kind of the ways they differed. We came up with seven different axes that, that we were to test. Um, here, this is the best practices. So basically, if we, if we vary each of the seven things and put them all in kind of the best position, uh, this is what you'd come up with. This is not necessarily saying that this is the best ever one, but, but it was the best of what we were testing. Um, and uh, this one is the worst of what we were testing. So you can see in the best one, we have uh, these nice bullets and we have two equal buttons about um, allowing cookies. And we have um, all of the choices right there on the screen. Um, and then in this worst one, we just have this uh, big chunk of text. It's at the bottom of the screen and there's only one button that says, okay. And there's a link embedded in the paragraph if you wanna go change your settings. Um, and then uh, we had another option, which was just this, this cookie um, preferences in the corner and that's it. And we have seen that on real websites. Um, okay, and we, we tested a bunch of others as well. So let me just show you the punchline here of the most important results. Um, so uh, for that best practices, we looked at what did people actually choose on the website when presented with the best practices. And we see that like two thirds of them choose to use all cookies, um, but about a third are only taking strictly necessary cookies. And there were a bunch of similar things where we, we used uh, paragraphs instead of bullets, and you don't see a big difference there. Um, I, I think the bullets are a lot nicer, but at the end of the day, it doesn't make that much difference. Um, but if you look at our worst practices, you see that hardly anybody, there's that little tiny sliver of red went for only strictly necessary. Most people are accepting all cookies or that purple bit on the right, they're actually not doing anything. They're just ignoring it, um, which effectively means they're getting all the cookies. And then that corner button, nobody did anything. Not a single person actually interacted with the corner button. Um, so you can see here that this really does make a big difference. And we have ongoing work in this area. All right, final uh, takeaways, um, privacy interfaces, uh, 
uh, hopefully you're convinced now they suffer from lots of usability problems, and this is exacerbated in an IoT world. Uh, standardization of disclosures and choice mechanisms can really help. Uh, machine readable policies and automated choice tools can really help. And we need to actually evaluate these things with users and find out what works and what doesn't. And I will end it there. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kreiner, for uh, present us this, uh, I think, interesting and impactful work um, over, I think, more than 10 years. <laughs>